DNA is more important than any other factor in shaping who we are. So whether your child could be the next Roger Federer or Elon Musk depends on their genetics. Well, that's the view of our next guest on Feeling Good. Professor Robert Plowman is a psychologist and behavioral geneticist who works at King's College London. And his new book, Blueprint, How DNA Makes Us Who We Are, outlines why he thinks this way. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. So everything from whether we are extroverted or introverted, what career we're good at, even whether we have mental illness, your view is that it's all about genes. Well, not just my view. It's 45 years of research of myself, my team, and many other people around the world. There's a real consensus that um, inherited DNA differences are the primary systematic source of who we are. Um, and that contrasts so much with what psychologists used to think. Like when I was in graduate school 45 years ago, everyone was an, an environmentalist. They assumed that you are what you learn. Mm -hmm. Schizophrenia, for example, was thought to be due to what your mother did to you in the first few years of life. At that time, when I was in graduate school, it was dangerous personally and professionally to even talk about genetic influence. Now, after four decades of research, there's a real consensus that inherited DNA differences account for about half of the differences between people in the things you mentioned, like personality, cognitive abilities, and mental health and illness. So people, like we said, you know, Elon Musk or Roger or, you know, Serena Williams, this kind of success, they are born with it. It's not a, a something that they have learned or made. Well, especially in the area of talent like that, there's quite a bit of uh, interest in that issue. And what we're talking about is the normal range of individual differences. So we're not talking about the Roger Federer extremes, mm -hmm. but for that normal range of environmental and genetic differences, genetics accounts for about half of the differences that we observe between people. Our experiences count for the other half. And um, that includes like your experiences with your family, school, and friends. But those experiences don't make a systematic difference. They don't change who we are. They're important, they matter, but they don't change who we are. So that if, we, if we, you had been adopted at birth and raised in a different family, gone to a different school, and had different friends, you would still essentially be the same person you are. And the most dramatic example of that uh, is studies of identical twins reared apart who are brought together for the first time in adulthood. Mm -hmm. And like this film that's just, um, it's just uh, coming out next month called Three Identical Strangers, which is about this remarkable story of three identical twins, identical twin triplets who wow. were separated at birth and were brought back together. And, you know, you're just dumbfounded by how similar they are. Yeah, so that's, that sounds so interesting. So is this to say then that, you know, parents that are out there that are, you know, we call them tiger parents, right? Tiger moms and dads that are out there really, yeah. you know, pushing their children to be successful. Are they somehow also wasting their time if these aren't their natural gifts? This has a profound message for parents. If anyone thinks children are a blob of clay that you mold to be whatever you want them to be, they're really very wrong. As parents, we don't make much of a difference. We matter a lot. It's, it's the most crucial relationship in children's development. And, you know, relationships are things you should enjoy. And, you know, you, you, know, you have these relationships. You don't marry someone to change them. And really, to a large extent, I think what parents should think about doing is relaxing more and trying to see what their child wants to do and what their child is good at. And that's something I think that's an important message now, given all these parenting books, mm -hmm. that I, I'd, I'd be afraid of being a parent nowadays because, you know, they lay such a burden of anxiety on parents about one false move and your child's going to be ruined forever. And it just isn't true. So I think it is an important message. It doesn't mean you can't do anything as a parent, mm -hmm. but you'd be much better off going with the, the grain of genetic propensities. Find out what your child likes to do, rather than preordaining my child is going to be a Roger Federer or some musical genius. It's much better to see, give them opportunities to see what they like to do and what they do well, and then to kind of maximize their strengths and minimize their weaknesses, rather than preordaining how they will become. 
So, so if we take this a little further and we look in terms of a career, how can this kind of information help people when they make these kinds of choices or these kinds of decisions in their lives? Yes, well, we haven't even touched on the DNA revolution, which is the main, uh, the most exciting thing that's happened in the last couple of years. We're now able to predict these genetic propensities from birth. We can read the DNA blueprint that will tell us uh, how our children will turn out, the, their problems and their promise. And the most predictive one of all right now is how well they'll do at school. And what that means is that some parents are going to find out that their child, their genetic propensity for learning isn't very good. That is, they, they will find it difficult at school. It doesn't mean they can't do it, but they'll find it difficult and therefore kind of unrewarding. And I think it's very important for parents to recognize that children are different from early in life. And it's not to say, oh, well, we give up on a child, but if you... You know, I, I find this with my university-educated friends especially. You know, you just can't tolerate the possibility your child might not want to go to university. But um, it's important to realize that university isn't for everyone. There's lots of things that people can do in, life, in their life that ought to be rewarding and rewarded, not just, you know, the academic track. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. That's actually something that, that in Switzerland is a reality in the sense that young people are given a choice of whether or not they want to pursue university or go the route of what they call an apprenticeship, which gives them more hands-on training in different kinds of jobs that aren't necessarily academic. The German and, and Swiss system is definitely good, and it's good for society, too, mm -hmm. you know, because we need the plumbers and carpenters and electricians. We yes. don't just need people who yes. can set up new electronic systems. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think that's a very good uh, approach. And then for parents then to, it's hard for university educated parents though to accept that their children are only 50% chips off the old block. They're 50% <laughs> different. And that can mean well, that some parents of highly educated kids, are, are parents who are highly educated are gonna have children who just don't like it, you know? You can force them to do it. But how good is that for them or the parents or your relationship with your children? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, as a parent myself, I, I do often think, and when I read the title of your book, I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, how, how much did I even bother then, you know, trying to, it, it, you know, it's almost gives, it almost gives a parent permission to be a little bit more hands off, this, these kinds of, uh, your, the DNA revolution you were talking about. Yeah, well, or, yeah, you could say hands off where it could be you could enjoy the relationship more. You know, if, if you get married and you marry someone because you say, well, they basically got some good things here, but I'm going to really change them and make them to be what I want them to be. Well, that's a recipe for a disastrous relationship. Mm -hmm. You want to be with someone. You want to enjoy them. You love them, so you want to do good for them. If there's something you can do to help them, you'll do that. And I think it's similar, you know, being a parent. And I'm, I'm being a little bit um, uh, strong in these statements, but you need an antidote to all the child-blaming sorts of parenting books that are out there. Well, I was going to say, you're, you're probably picking a fight with all of the child, <laughs> all the people, this, this, this parenting uh, world that we have going on, you know, uh, with, with books and advice and columns, etc. that say otherwise, right? That say it's all about nurture. And don't you think, don't you think, yeah, yeah. And, but don't you think that a lot of that's almost designed to make parents anxious? You know, one, you do one thing wrong or you don't give them 10,000 hours of training in something or you're not a tiger mom, for example. You know, there's so little evidence to back those things up. Mm -hmm. And what they don't ever mention is that these psychological findings of parenting maybe explain 1% or 2% of the differences between children. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 50, 60% of the differences. So there's this elephant in the room that all those parenting books seem to ignore. And it's so important for parents to realize they don't have as much control as they think. Yeah, clearly they would argue differently. <laughs> but I mean, nonetheless, it's an ongoing and very interesting debate, this nature versus nurture. Um, and it sounds like, you know, it sounds like there are many ways to, to just look at the situation. Yeah. And things are really changing with the DNA revolution. That's going to make all the difference because we're not just talking about abstract concepts of heredity here. We're saying with one cell and the DNA in that cell, you can make some of the strongest predictions about children's psychological development than anything else.
You know, we can now predict school achievement from DNA itself better than we can with anything else. So even when we're looking at, um, at business leaders around the world, you know, really top managers and, and as we say, uh, really successful people, I mean, how, how could they use this information to help them in their success? Well, I, um, the DNA revolution is changing psychology and it's changing clinical psychology, and I think it will eventually change society and our self-understanding. You know, like four million people have already paid their hundred dollars to um, get their genome um, genotypes from 23andMe, you know, a direct-to-consumer DNA company. And mostly they're doing that for self-understanding, largely for ancestry, but increasingly the sort of thing I'm talking about will become part of that. Not these single gene rare disorders, but rather, you know, like in Nature last a couple weeks ago, cardiovascular risk, for example, but also risk for mental illness. And we'll then increasingly turn away from the idea of waiting until people have a problem and then try to cure it. Because all of medicine is moving towards a preventive approach. And DNA is the best predictor, which is a necessary prerequisite for in prevention. Yes, and I, and I would assume that this kind of, um, as I hear you talk, you know, this, when, you, when you put out this kind of information, this access to this kind of knowledge, it also needs to come with a certain amount of support, right? Or else, you know, it could be perhaps even misinterpreted or you know, could lead to confusion if people don't know how to manage it and, and, and read it correctly. I mean, is that right? Yes, absolutely. And it's all new stuff, you know. I mean, there's a lot to work out, which is why I wanted to, to write this book now so that we launch this discussion, because it's really happening. This is not futuristic. It's happening right now. So we do need to talk about these things, because as you say, it's not simple to understand these genetic risks. But um, uh, I... I think, for, well, for example, what, four million people have paid their hundred dollars to do 23andMe. Mm -hmm. Now, they're getting that information themselves with no filters. And, part, you know, and so people are making that decision that they want to know about themselves. And, you know, there's a lot written about the ethics of this and should we have regulation of it. Absolutely. And, you know, there's the other side saying it seems kind of paternalistic to tell people they can't find out about their own DNA if they want to. But I think the better solution is to think about everybody having this genomic information, whether you can afford a hundred bucks or not, mm -hmm. as, say, part of the NHS. And then the NHS could decide, where's the evidence good enough that they feel you would want to know about it, if you want to know about it. You know, like for dementia, a lot of people choose not to tick the box that will give them the genetic um, information to predict whether or not they'll get um, Alzheimer's disease. So I think that's a better way to go, but a lot of people are getting this information anyway, and um, they're, they're reasonably pleased with it. You know, there are some scary stories as well. So I agree that we just need to talk about these issues. and you know, what, what as a society we want to do with this information because it is powerful information. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, at least it sounds like as parents we can start <laughs> by observing our children and trying to, you know, to motivate them in the direction that it seems that they are naturally motivated towards. We can start with this. Yes. And then maybe... And, and <laughs> yes, then we'll, that sounds and like then, a good idea. And then we'll move forward. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. Really appreciate your, your interesting uh, insights well, today. Very nice talking to you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.